Good afternoon and welcome to the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership webinar on top to bottom trophic interrogation of Michigan Inland Lake communities using eDNA metabar coding. I'm Joe Noner. I'm the coordinator for the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership and I'd like to share a little information about the partnership and logistics for the webinar before we get started with our presentation. The Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership hosts these lake conservation webinars to share science, management, and outreach efforts of interest to our partners. You can keep us up to date with you can keep up to date with our webinars by checking the webinar page at midwestglaciallakes.org. Webinars in the series will be added to our webpage alongside other webinars of interest, with the goal of having four to ten webinars per year. Um, we found ourselves, uh, like many others, um, homebound over the next few months, and so we've got a webinar blitz that will be occurring um, for the next three or four Thursdays. Um, and then uh, there's another webinar in later in May. So um, I encourage you, if you're interested in glacial lakes or natural lakes issues in the upper Midwest, to check out the website. Notification for the webinars will also be provided through the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnerships quarterly newsletter. You can sign up for that newsletter at our website. If you'd like to share your experience or project results through a webinar like this, you can. You can reach out to me at nonerj, N-O-H-N-E-R-J, at michigan.gov. You can also find my email on the website. For those of you unfamiliar with the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, we are a partnership of professionals and stakeholders focused on conserving over 4,000, 40,000 glacially formed inland lakes across an eight-state region. Our mission is to protect, rehabilitate, and enhance sustainable fish habitats in the glacial lakes of the Midwest for the use and enjoyment of current and future generations. The partnership provides science for lake conservation, such as our conservation planner that provides information about every lake in the partnership. It provides outreach and education to stakeholders and professionals through webinars, news releases, Twitter conversations, and the sharing of materials related to lake conservation. And we provide funding for science, education, and outreach, and on the ground rehabilitation or protection projects through our Lakes Conservation Grant. This grant is released every year in August and provides about $250,000 to $300,000 a year for lake conservation projects that benefit fishes. A few logistics about today's presentation. It should last about 40 minutes, and we'll hold the remaining time for questions. Participants will be muted during the webinar. So I encourage you, if you have questions, please use the question and answer function to submit them. You can find the question and answer function by hovering your mouse down to the bottom of your screen and locating the Q&A icon. <clears throat> I will moderate those questions and we'll try to get to them all. If for some reason you have technical difficulties or you'd like to share this webinar with others that cannot attend, we'll post a video of the webinar to our website um, and we'll follow up with an email to those that attended and to those that didn't attend. Today's speaker is Dr. Kim Scribner. Kim is a professor in the Michigan State University Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. He's a member of the Partnership for Ecosystem Research and Management, which is a collaboration between Michigan State University and the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan. Um, Dr. Gribner is an evolutionary ecologist with broad interests in population genetics, vertebrate life history, demography, and behavior. The presentation today will be top to bottom trophic inter interrogation of Michigan inland lake communities using eDNA metabarcoding. And with that, I will turn the stage over to Dr. Scribner. Take it away. Oops. Does everybody hear me okay? Um, I'd like to thank Midwest Great Lakes Partnership um, for the invitation to present some of our group's work today. This seminar series is a great way to bring people together and venues like this are really important in the difficult times we're currently in when communications has become more difficult. Over the last five years or so, our research group in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University has developed databases and used molecular tools generally referred to as barcoding uh, 
to inventory inland lake communities across trophic levels. And a portion of this work will be presented today. I'm the mouthpiece for a very large number of group of people that have conducted the lion's share of this work. And I'd like to acknowledge many of the primary people involved. The contributor list is bookended by Dr. John Robinson and myself, who served as project PIs. Special recognition is warranted for the two postdoctoral researchers, Lillian Puck and Nick Sard, who led each of the two uh, primary grants associated with the work. Lucas Nathan and Seth Herps um, were our two primary agency cooperators with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Jeanette Koneski is our lab coordinator, was involved in a lot of the sequencing and bioinformatics work. And Ellie Weiss, Amanda Heathman, Janelle Urig and Rebecca Shelby were undergraduate researchers who were involved in much of the field and lab work. This work was uh, primarily funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and many additional cooperating agencies and groups uh, provided logistical support. So as an outline of what I'd like to go over with you today, um, first of all, uh, introduce environmental DNA generally and this concept of metabarcoding. Many of you may have heard of environmental or eDNA, most likely in the context of Asian carp or other efforts to detect or not, uh, so presence, absence of invasive species, but we'll be talking about um, expanding that uh, using metabarcoding. And secondly, um, we'll provide some comparisons of sampling efficiency between this eDNA metabarcoding and traditional sampling methods, and the emphasis will be on fish. So we came to realize through interactions with um, our agency cooperators that for people to really buy into eDNA metabarcoding, we would really have to compare our information with more standard measures of diversity, abundance, et cetera, um, such as available through the Michigan DNR's Status and Trends Program. And so the first part of the presentation will be some comparisons of the eDNA metabarcoding of fish communities um, with status and trends. And a lot of this is available through a publication that was out last year in the journal Environmental uh, DNA by Nick Sard. Continuing on, um, we'll expand uh, coverage geographically to more lakes and we'll focus more specifically on aquatic invasive species and about physical landscape features, characteristics physically and biotically of the lakes themselves and the surrounding areas. And we'll expand our taxonomic coverage for these inland lakes, looking at other vertebrates, um, arthropods, gastropods, mollusks, and plants. And this is the work that uh, Lillian Puck was largely uh, leading. So what is environmental DNA? Well, all organisms leave traces of cell debris um, and material um, in the water sample. And so I'm gonna use my mouse here uh, as a, a laser pointer. So, uh, you know, skin damaged tissue, metabolic waste, feces, for instance, free DNAs, um, are extruded by all organisms, all living organisms into the water. And this information can be used to estimate species presence absence, including aquatic invasive species and threatened endangered species. And it's been shown by a number of people that the relative sequence abundance of different taxa really provides a surrogate estimate of the relative biomass of these species in the sampling areas. So one sample contains information about inquire entire aquatic communities across trophic levels, um, and really uh, interrogation of uh, these lake communities in conjunction with use of databases that are available um, uh, of surrounding land use practices really provides a landscape perspective uh, uh, to interpret the lake data. So again, most people thinking about what is eDNA barcoding thinks about um, identifying the presence absence of a target species. And so let's say uh, the DNA is of species green. And so by sampling water and isolating DNA, um, and in the presence of uh, DNA sequence collections from other particular species, the people who do this have identified that these primers um, um, or these methods are very species specific 
and that they are very sensitive. And so if you're looking for a specific species, typically what you do is you design a short fragment of DNA. And if that DNA is completely homologous to your species of choice, it matches. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And then if you're using uh, antiseptic laboratory conditions, you can use various measures a visualization to determine whether um, that species is there or not. You'll get an amplification product or you won't. And here, for instance, you see um, uh, spots on a gel, which is DNA fragments. Uh, and these 10 samples, there are four of them that are positive for that particular species. And so the emphasis of this is really designing of a primer. So the only thing that's going to amplify is the species of choice. And that's really what is quite different from eDNA metabarcoding. So for species of, of interest, we're trying to look at entire communities. And so trying to find areas of um, discordance, what you're trying to do is find areas um, of homology. Here, each line represents a separate DNA sequence of an individual. The different colors represent different base pairs, A's, G's, C's, and T's. And, um, by finding areas which are flanking regions which are quite variable, and you can see the menage a trois of different colors here in the middle, you're able to amplify all individual DNAs for a taxonomic group, and you're relying on the, on the heterogeneity within these primers um, to detect different species. And there are a variety of different markers that are available. Mostly they've been developed for um, uh, mitochondrial DNA or chloroplast DNA for animals and plants respectively. And this is because unlike chromosomal DNA, which is linear, uh, these, these DNAs, mtDNA and chloroplast DNAs are close circular um, and they're less susceptible to degradation in the environment. So we, um, so armed with these primers, the next thing that you do is you go out and get your water sample. Um, this is a, a bit of a propaganda for Smith Root. We do use their uh, sampler because it has a very nice pump associated with it. And this is uh, some of their literature. So this is an individual collecting a certain amount of eDNA. Um, at the very end of the uh, device is something where you have a filter paper. Um, you use a tweezers to remove that um, and save that. And this is sort of what it looks like right here. These are, at least what we use, are one micron filter. So this basically is a sieve and you're sucking water of a certain volume. We use uh, a liter through that and we're using antiseptically sterilized tweezers to pull that off. So that's what Smith Root says you can do. This is what we do. Um, we either take surface samples, so you can see the gloves and the gloves here. And we take a liter of water from the surface or we we'll use a Van Dorn sample if we're interested in taking benthic samples. And the water is either collected from the surface or it's poured out of the Van Dorn into a liter. And then we use the Smith root just to, to suck up and filter um, that water through this. And it's all the material, the DNA, the cellular material, which is put uh, kept on there. So the throughput going from one to seven here is you go out and uh, you collect your sample. Number two, you uh, extract DNA from that. Uh, one of the things that we do, because a lot of the water we sample uh, is not potentially the cleanest in the world and it contains substances which can inhibit polymerase chain reaction, then we go through a multi-decontamination step. Um, and then we place uh, the DNA from individual sampling locations and individual lakes. We amplify using those primers. Um, the question is, well, how do you tell the DNAs from one location and one lake? And we can do that because we can link a seven or eight base pair primer of a different DNA sequence on the end of the DNA and then link the, the PCR primers on that. So every single sample from every local lake has a different seven or eight base pair code and then you can subject that to sequencing in step four then you can sort the dna's based on that individual barcode and then within the the different barcoded locations and lakes by um, a species that you can identify based on your baseline once you've identified the species and the relative numbers of sequence for each of those species you can actually do your
ecological analysis. And so we're going to kind of move uh, quickly through one through six and really more focus on what you can do with the data, but hopefully this uh, serves to demystify the process uh, a little bit. And then, yeah, you got to compare the sequences. And so what we were interested in doing uh, is interrogating uh, whole ecosystems. And so uh, lake communities are very complex. There are multiple levels. I'm not going to be talking about this very low level of bacteria, uh, lower eukaryotes like fungi and oomycetes, although we do work quite a bit with them. I'm not going to talk about that today. And there are primers that will interrogate those communities, but we're using uh, this RBCL, um, uh, which is a chloroplast uh, primer for uh, plants and a variety of different primers here. And so by taking a single sample of water, which contains the DNA from many, many different organisms across the trophic level, we're, we're using uh, different sets of primers on the same DNA from the same samples in the lakes uh, to interrogate uh, animal life as well as plants within uh, each lake community. So in terms of the methods, uh, we've had to develop the taxonomic databases for each of these taxonomically and geographically different uh, uh, groups. So for instance, vertebrates, primarily fishes, arthropods, mollusks, and plants. So in our database uh, that we'll talk about today, we've uh, sampled from 22 lakes, um, 13 of those lakes have strat status and trends information for fish. Recognizing that organisms are found in different portions of the lake, closer to the surface, closer to the bottom, we take surface and benthic samples and all total the data that I'll talk about today is about 1,000 eDNA samples, um, which were sequenced uh, about 50 samples uh, per, per lake. So this is the spatial distribution of the lake. There are 22 of them. One of the things that we were interested in was to see if we could have representation of different classifications of different lakes in different locations of the, across the lake. And so one of the things that we did was take some work from Kevin Worley and people at the IFR for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And Kevin and his colleagues recognized that using temperature, lake mean temperature um, and uh, size, um, he developed, the, or they developed the classification scheme uh, where you could separate the lakes on a time and size spectrum. And uh, we uh, sampled lakes from five of those six spectra. So these are the lake classes, uh, and these are the number of uh, lakes that are represented um, in each of these different categories. So size and temperature was one way that the lakes can be classified. There are other really wonderful databases that are um, available for, um, uh, for use. Uh, this is something out of uh, the Landscape Limnology Group in the Fisheries in Michigan State, um, Pat Serrano and uh, Kendra Cervalo and their colleagues um, have a wonderful database. It's called Lagos. It's a web-based repository of information. Um, um, 51,000 lakes, many of them in Michigan. There's information on, on lake characteristics in terms of water chemistry, climate, land use. Some of the information is historical and uh, we were using this to mine data for each of our 22 lakes. As an example, here are some of the measures that we were interested in. So you can get the different uh, dots here and the different colors correspond to variation canopy cover. We were primarily interested in surrounding land use. So whether land was developed for uh, human use, uh, such as cottages, subdivisions, whether it was an ag or whether it was forested. So this is just um, a couple of different variables that are available that we've used uh, out of the Lagos database. And here are a list that we were interested in using for species distribution modeling and some of the occupancy modeling that we did. So these are the lakes, um, the lake sample sizes. Um, here's some information about depth and area and the, the uh, uh, lake classification. Then there's lake covariates, which describe um, such things as connectivity in terms of uh, how many um, lakes or the size of watersheds upstream, which might be connecting um, the particular lakes to other areas. Also importance in terms of vectoring. Aquatic invasive species are things like the number of boat launches. 
And this distant weighted population uh, average is something that was interested. So uh, one might expect, for instance, that a lake which is closely associated with major population centers may be uh, experiencing greater use. And so this is basically a, a, a weighted distance in terms of geographic distance between each county, the counties weighted by the population estimates. And so for instance, you have two lakes here, Cass Lake and Thompson Lake, which relatively higher values. These are areas which are close to the Detroit metro area relative to these two lakes, Manistique and Brevort Lakes, which were up in the UP, which have very low values. So the taxonomic databases that we have to develop, so you get the sequences, but you have to tell which, which species these uh, sequences belong to. And we do that by producing um, our own databases. And so here's a database for fish um, based on the DNR and other pieces of information. We uh, developed a sequence database using these two different primers for native fishes, as well as aquatic invasive species or soon to be aquatic invasive species. Um, and for this, because these primers also amplify other vertebrates, we put other vertebrate species in there. So uh, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, for uh, arthropods, mollusks, and gastropods, this is our sequence database that we've developed um, uh, in the library. So over 1,800 arthropods, 200 mollusks and gastropods, including aquatic invasive species. And we also, using the uh, RBCL gene, we were able to gather sequences in GenBank and produced in our lab for 2,200 uh, uh, plant species, including aquatic invasive species. So this represents the baseline information of sequences by which we can pigeonhole all the sequences we're collecting from the eDNA uh, to tell who's uh, uh, in the mix and in, uh, in what combinations. So we use a program called Mother, uh, which is our pipeline, um, which aligns the the eDNA sequences to the taxonomic databases and anything that's not classified based on our taxonomic database, uh, we take through uh, and look at repositories of sequence through the National Center for Biological Information via BLAST. And so what we have is for each lake, for each sample, benthic or surface, we have counts of sequences for every single species uh, that we have um, uh, the ability to classify. And that's essentially our community matrix that we're taking into our analyses. So um, here is a picture of one of the lakes. And so 13 out of the 22 lakes um, uh, were lakes that had status and trends uh, fish sampling. And so status and trends, if you aren't familiar, is a, a procedure whereby multiple different gear types and here's a couple of them are used. Uh, locations are identified, and here are the triangles are the traditional gear. Uh, circles are the eDNA. Um, and in lakes with status and trends, we tried to pair up um, our eDNA sampling locations, status and trend lakes. Um, in lakes without traditional gear, we used a random sampling um, model to identify locations and GPS coordinates that we were to sample in. So. Here's our two eDNA gear types, a surface and a benthic type, and there were multiple gear types there. So not only did we try to look at different classifications, but this is just a picture of eight of the locations, um, the areas, excuse me, of the, the lakes are there. And you can see they're really quite heterogeneous. Um, some of our impoundments, some like Pentwater are collected, connected to a great lake, uh, great disparities in terms of surrounding forest versus ag versus um, you know, development um, that we had um, projected uh, might be in, important, uh, particularly in terms of uh, aquatic invasive species presence and abundance. So now to the results. So this is just um, the uh, eDNA classifications. So across all, uh, all 22 lakes, we identified 61 OTUs and most of them to species some to general level. So these are the lakes, these are the number of species. Um, lakes like Prentwater uh, had a high species number. And again, that's perhaps not surprising because it's connected to a great lake on one side and a river on another. Uh, lakes like George Lake, uh, which is just north of uh, Clare, uh, much lower numbers. 
In terms of comparisons to eDNA and traditional gear, generally the species caught with traditional gear were also detected with eDNA. Generally, greater numbers of species were detected with eDNA than traditional gear, and eDNA detected aquatic invasive species, oftentimes in lakes where traditional gear did not. And so here's um, uh, an example of the mean number of species. So mean per traditional gear, mean per eDNA sample. Uh, blue is eDNA, green is traditional for each of eight lakes. And you can see here that um, for all but one of the lakes, um, uh, and this was statistically significant, eDNA samples more species, so greater species richness uh, on average per sample than does uh, traditional gear. So this is just example for one lake. And so <clears throat> in this particular lake, the traditional gear were three different gear types, small mesh gill nets, large mesh gill nets, and experimental um, or small, uh, large mesh spike nets and experimental gill nets. And the two here were uh, uh, surface and benthic. The colors represent the relative abundance of each of the species, uh, either from the gear, uh, traditional gear counts, um, or the relative abundance of sequences. And what I've done is I color coded the different species here. And so the traditional gear in this particular lake, they found 10 different species of fish. Those same 10 species were found with traditional gear. So two of the species identified with traditional gear were in relatively high abundance in blue here. Likewise, they were with eDNA. Largemouth bass was relatively high abundant, but it was found in less than half of the traditional sample sites. It was, it was detected by eDNA in every sample throughout the lake. Um, these these I, fish ID within, um, uh, were found in both traditional and eDNA, and they were much more geographically represented uh, in the eDNA samples. But perhaps more importantly, um, well, and here's one example. So channel catfish was detected in almost every single eDNA sample, but it was only located in one gear type um, in one location within the lake. But really, um, importantly, um, the eDNA uh, detected about twice the number of species. So there were eight more species that weren't detected with traditional gear. Um, and further, uh, we detected round gobies with eDNA in two locations that was not detected with traditional gear. Another way of looking at um, a comparison between gears is, so you go out and you sample and you get a community a fish community, so the relative abundance or the relative sequence abundance in, in eDNA terms of these sequences. And one of the things that you can do is you can estimate a distance. And we use a metric called Bray-Curtis distance. It's just a way with one number to estimate the differences in communities between two samples. And you can ordinate those in this particular diagram. Uh, blue and red represent two different primer pairs. This is for fish communities and the green is traditional gear for one of the lakes, five channel lakes. And we're ordinating this using a multivariate projection using multiple dimensional scaling. That's not important. What is important is look at the scatter of the plots. And so for each um, of the two um, uh, priming uh, primers and markers, you're getting much, much tighter. So basically all the samples are really pretty much telling you, you have really similar communities because the dots are closer together, because these gear types have very different capture probabilities and are targeting different species, that's fine for a lake level, but there's a higher levels of heterogeneity. So greater intersample similarities uh, in eDNA than uh, is re reported for the traditional gear. The other thing that you could do is, is say, you know, how intensively do you have to go out there and sample, right? And so here traditional is in red, um, uh, eDNA for one of the markers, uh, 12S is in blue. And what this shows is increasing species richness or an accumulation, and these are species accumulation curves, of species uh, accumulation as a, as a function of the number of samples taken. And what you can see here in terms of per additional sample taken, you're, you're collecting and you're adding many more species uh, using eDNA than you are with traditional gear. So we can expand those to, um, to all the, the locations where we have um, uh, both uh, status and trends and eDNA. 
And here is that same uh, Bray Curtis multiple dimensional scaling. And again, the blues and reds are really relatively more tightly clustered, generally speaking, uh, than are the traditional samples. And likewise, across um, all lakes, um, you can see here that um, here the, the traditional is in green and the red and the blue are the two different eDNA markers. And in many of the cases, you see that traditional, 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 in most of the cases, the species accumulation curves um, are much lower um, in terms of number of species added than is the case. Um, and in many of the cases, you're achieving near asymptote, which means you're able to project your sample to an asymptotic estimate of the number of species in the lakes. And you cannot do that um, in most cases uh, with traditional gear. There are other ways of looking at the comparisons between traditional gear. One of the ways is looking at um, rank abundance um, as, and um, the, the proportion of, of samples occupied um, by eDNA. And so this is for each of the, uh, for each of eight lakes, a rank abundance of what is the most common to the least common species. And along the y-axis species proportion occupied, or the, the proportion of the number of EDN, or eDNA sample locations where that species was present. And in six of the eight lakes, you see a significant association between um, what is the most common species rank of one from traditional gear and the proportion of sites occupied by eDNA. You can do the same thing looking at biomass. So the Stratosense Trends Program doesn't weigh the fish. So this really isn't a biomass estimate per se, but what they have is lengths. And so you could use a relative or, or mean length or mean length as a surrogate for biomass. And you can regress that with the log of the eDNA number of reads. And what we see here is that, again, there is a positive relationship. And for the eight lakes, there's a relationship between the log of the number of sequence reads, um, which is uh, uh, correlated with and could potentially serve um, as a surrogate of species biomass. So in terms of uh, aquatic invasive species, uh, again, focusing on eight status and trends lakes, the eDNA was much more effective at uh, uh, detecting aquatic invasive species. So um, the proportions of samples or the proportions of sequence reads, what we see is that six of the eight um, lakes, um, uh, uh, round goby was detected where only three of the eight lakes uh, where round gobies detected using traditional gear. And those lakes where round gobies weren't detected with traditional gear were lakes based on the eDNA in red here where they were relatively low abundance. And so in situations of low abundance, like the start of an invasion, um, or generally where the aquatic invasive species are much lower in abundance, it appears that the eDNA um, is more sensitive to detecting aquatic invasive species. So in terms of AIS across the lakes, across the 22 lakes, nine AIS were detected, including a number of species of carp, goldfish, round goby, rainbow smelt, alewives, and sea lamprey. Uh, the big three were alewife, common carp, and round goby. And this is uh, a graph showing the proportions of sequence reads for one of the primers, right? So 0% of the on average, almost 20,000 sequences per lake were 0% uh, or 100% were uh, aquatic invasive species. So for each of the 22 lakes, this was the number of species. And you can see that the orange is the proportion of sequence reads which were uh, invasive species. So contrast, for instance, George, Haithco, Walloon and White Camp Lakes, where the, the presence of invasive species, even if they were there, very low sequence numbers versus Holloway Reservoir, which is on uh, the Flint area, where 72% of the sequence reads were invasive species. Most of the biomass inferentially of that lake is in aquatic invasive species. So the fact that they're there and they're there in a certain abundance doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story. And so one of the things that we've been doing is using heat maps, um, using projections to uh, look at where the relative abundance are. Are there hot spots in both species richness and in invasive species presence and absence? And so here are the different colors. 
on the top for two different lakes, Pentwater and Dumont represent um, the uh, number of, of uh, species. So species richness uh, down here for two invasive species for the same lengths, uh, the, the relative number of reeds per thousand um, in these different lakes. And so each of the dots here represents an eDNA sampling location. So it's really interesting here. So in terms of species richness for Dumont Lake, there were areas of really high species richness. And it's really interesting that those areas were areas of really very low uh, abundance of these aquatic invasive species and vice versa. Same thing with Pentwater, there are very high species richness. And those same areas are generally areas of low invasive species abundance. And so these are really very, I think, insightful ways of looking at potentially biotic interactions that may explain uh, the, not only the locations, um, but the, the uh, interactions that may result in differential abundance and distribution. And so we're really answering a number of questions here. So not only are they there, but where are they? and what habitat or biotic features are associated with differential relative abundance within the water bodies where they're present. So continuing on, and this is uh, a march into the Lagos database, we're interested in using the metabarcoding lake survey data to build models of aquatic invasive species presence absence using occupancy modeling and species distribution modeling. And this is still moving on, but basically we're interested in modeling presence absence and we're doing that by focusing on measures of connectivity. So what is the lake area? The idea being that maybe a larger lake is more attractive to an angler that are vectoring invasive species via boat traffic, um, public access, and also adjoining landscapes. So productivity, um, uh, land use, um, et cetera. And then there are various biomass diversity estimators which speak to the potential effects of uh, biotic interactions. So just some, some preliminary work, this work is still ongoing. So we were interested in for, the, uh, for all the 22 lakes, are the proportion of uh, aquatic invasive species sequence reads related to any of those? And actually they're positively, if this isn't significant, but there's a positive trend to the fact that you in, have increasing proportions of species, a higher number of AIS reads as the lake area um, um, of upstream uh, uh, water bodies um, and drainages uh, is larger. So the larger the upstream area draining into the lake, the higher the sequence reads. This is interesting. So the number of invasive species, so the lakes either had zero, one, two, or three aquatic invasive species. Those lakes with zero aquatic invasive species had less than 25% of the surrounding landscape out to 100, 500 meters um, in development or agriculture. Most of these areas with no invasive species were areas that were primarily forested. Those lakes that had one or two aquatic invasive species had intermediate levels of development and forested. The areas uh, or the lakes that had three aquatic invasive species had a much higher level of development. So it looks like, you know, development either ag or uh, urban or suburbanization, uh, suburbanization um, seem to look uh, positively correlated with the number of aquatic invasive species. Um, getting back to the area, the, the question of uh, gear detectability, we were interested in using uh, occupancy models um, to develop ideas of probabilities of detection. And so here are the two markers, 12S and 16S in surface and benthic. And then these other things um, are the different gear that were available. And we were looking at uh, two aquatic invasive species. These are round gobies uh, and common carp. These are the two most uh, prevalent aquatic invasive species. And we're using A. McAlvia because the DNR was interested in the potential surrogate for snakeheads. And so what we see for all three of these species is generally that um, there's heterogeneity among the standard gear types but concordance in probabilities of detection across the eDNA markers, and in many cases, uh, they're equal to or uh, have higher detection probabilities than the, uh, than the traditional gear. I said that the markers were also uh, amplifying things other than fish. 
Um, generally, the yellow portions of the frequency histograms, which show the percent of vertebrate sequences of each of these different groups, so reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, fish, and humans. Um, most of them are fish, um, but there are others that aren't, so we're amplifying other things. And so, for instance, we have uh, Akiak Lake, which has um, a high number of uh, mammals uh, and bird sequences along with the fishes. And there's uh, Mullet Lake, which has a high proportion of uh, human sequences. So this is value added to the extent that you're interested in status and trends and using a technique where you're looking at more fish, other members of communities um, that are occupying or using these areas, uh, this appears to be a, a viable alternative as well. So expanding upon fish, we did a pilot study, and I'm moving into non-fish stuff here. Uh, um, we did a pilot study in 2007, and we chose two lakes to really intensively look at not only um, uh, different groups, so not just fish, but also plants, gastropods, bivalves, um, and crayfish, and other arthropods generally. So we took two lakes, Lake George and Mullet Lake, we were interested in sampling. Is there really a, a, a good time to sample? You know, um, is it early or is it late? You might think, for instance, in plants, uh, you have much more vegetative matter later in the season than early in the season. So we were interested in looking at, trying to get our heads around, you know, how to operationalize the sampling for different groups. So sample at different times of the year, we need to focus on surface or benthic samples. And um, are there commonalities between the different taxa um, that we can come to grips with? So here are some data. And so here are the two lakes, Lake George in the top, and this is Mullet Lake. For early and late um, uh, seasons, this, uh, the light and dark represent um, surface and benthic samples. And this is the number of species observed per sample. And so there are some generalities here. Um, uh, so for instance, um, uh, some, it appears that perhaps benthic samples may be slightly more efficient. Depending on the taxa, um, perhaps sampling earlier might be better than later. Um, uh, perhaps for plants, sampling later might be earlier. And so th there are some things that we're working out in terms of what um, we might provide in terms of uh, uh, um, you know, uh, an operationalization of uh, these techniques of when and where to go out. So um, aquatic invasive species um, uh, that are plants are really very uh, of, of major interest. Um, there was a paper some years ago um, and through some uh, discussions with Joanna Freeland, um, who's up at Peterborough in Ontario, um, we were looking at developing um, uh, metabarcoding for plants. And after a little bit of tweaking, um, uh, we settled on uh, in trying to look at three different plant groups. So this MATK, um, PCRL, and uh, a TRNL, uh, tRNA leucine. And one of the concerns was, you know, well, what is the coverage in the literature? How many species and how many sequences are there? Um, we used TRNL leucine because it was short and it was a sequence that was available and it seemed to be working for us. But we decided because of the sheer number of sequences that were available to use this particular sequence. And so that region um, in our database uh, through looking at sequence databases and our own sequencing, we developed the information for more than 2,000 plant species uh, that occur in Michigan, um, including aquatic invasive species. <clears throat> and this is the information. So um, these are the 22 different lakes. These are the proportion of the sequences um, that are either algal, aquatic, obligate, or facultative wet species or terrestrial. And I highlight the terrestrial here because we were a little surprised. What we were interested in was aquatic vascular plants. What we were sampling was by far and away largely terrestrial plants, which was um, a bit of a surprise. Um, but when you think about the amount of pollen that gets shed because most of these plants were dominated uh, by conifers, um, uh, uh, maples, um, other flowering plants, um, perhaps it wasn't surprising, but 22% were uh, aquatic vascular plants, 
and we were able to get algae and we were able to get uh, aquatic uh, or wetland species, including um, uh, invasive species in all four groups. And um, finally, with um, the CO1 data that we have, this data are preliminary. Um, it turned out that a lot of the sequences, even though we had a fairly large sequence baseline of 1,800 arthropod sequences and 200 mollusks and gastropods, many of them were unclassified. But out of the samples, we were able to identify um, a number of different species uh, in the different lakes for arthropods, uh, including crayfish. Um, and uh, AIS and these AIS species here for bivalves and ga uh, uh, gastropods uh, uh, were zebra mussels and quagga mussels largely. So um, that's uh, what I had to share with you today. I guess the question is uh, in terms of uh, eDNA, uh, well, uh, can it be used? So what's uh, what's in your wallet? Um, is this a credit card you want to pull out uh, or uh, can uh, be used? Um, I guess with the information that we have today, um, uh, there is still some uncertainty about the utility of these markers. Um, uh, I think for fish, we have that pretty well worked out. Uh, we're certainly moving along in that same direction for others, but unquestionably, particularly when you compare it to other means of semi-quantitative sampling, for non-fish species, I think uh, the results to date have been very encouraging, and we look forward to uh, further interactions with our uh, agency and stakeholder cooperators to continue moving that forward. So with that, um, I will uh, continue with my acknowledgments with uh, agency funding uh, and cooperator support. There's a couple of our cooperators, postdoc and undergraduate, enjoying a sunny day on the lake. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Great, thanks, Kim. <clears throat> We've got two questions in the question and answer now, a couple more um, coming in. And so I'd encourage folks, if you have a question, to submit it using the question and answer function, which again, you can find by hovering your mouse down toward the bottom of your screen, um, and then there's a Q&A icon there. So our first question is, um, how long will eDNA be present in the water body? For example, if the last breeding pair of a certain species was present on June 1st, but then was eaten by a predator on June 2nd, how long would that species of DNA, how long would that species DNA be present in the water body? Well, I would add a further step to that process of defecation of the fish species in question, which may extend the process a little bit. But um, well, I mean, it's a very good question. I mean, um, most of the, uh, d there's no question that UV light in particular uh, degrades DNA. Um, and so there is a finite life of DNA. Um, and it's a, a combination of the amount that was initially present um, uh, and, uh, you know, temperature, the higher the temperature, the faster the degradation, um, the more the sunshine, the higher rates of degradation. Um, there have been people that have been doing studies on sensitivity and longevity. Um, uh, these have been under controlled situations. Um, uh, so it doesn't last for um, ever. Um, likewise, it, it just because you sample in one place doesn't mean that that species was right there, right? I mean, you can get, you know, uh, wind patterns, uh, which are primarily west to east. And so you have uh, a tendency for potentially higher eDNA abundance on the, you know, leeward rather than the windward side of lakes, which look at the, the accumulations of eDNA through wind action, uh, that sort of thing. And so, um, the other, the other thing is that, um, you know, some species where you're sampling, you know, may be in different areas, right? So they may, uh, uh, they may be in shallow areas for spawning in deeper areas. Um, and so, you know, it's a really a good question. Our way of addressing that was trying to sample both benthic um, and surface samples because of the different areas of occupancy. The other thing is that DNA, uh, isn't neutrally buoyant, it sinks. And, um, you know, by sampling benthic areas, 
Uh, uh, with the Van Dorn sampler, you might be better able to uh, detect DNA uh, for a longer period of time after it's been. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns. Another question is, well, maybe a sample late in the fall or early in the spring after turnover, right? If the eDNA has settled out, uh, water's cold, it hasn't degraded. I mean, there's some really interesting questions if you're looking at entire communities about uh, what to handle. And I don't think it's going to be, uh, you know, universally the same answer um, for different tax. I think, you know, plants are different than fishes are different than, um, you know, other things. So that was a very long winded answer to a simple question. Uh, well, I, I, you actually, I think, covered another question in, in that answer as well. So uh, it was a good one. Um, the next question, uh, and this was this question was asked slightly before you went through some of the um, some of the presentation was, can this technique be used to ascertain parasite host relationships such as in swimmers itch, avian snail, uh, Zicaria identification uh, in lakes? Oh, 100%. Um, so uh, we just weren't using primers to detect those, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, you could detect them in terms of presence absence. Um, that's probably what you would probably like to do. So you would be able to develop an assay which would be sensitive to um, or, or specific to the species of choice. And then you would do exactly the same thing. Absolutely, 100%. Another thing that you could do with these single species markers, we were using the counts of sequences of a species relative to other species as a measure of relative abundance or relative biomass. If you have a single species of assay, one of the things that you could establish um, is uh, using quantitative PCR where you can establish the relative quantity of DNA of a sequence. So you may have areas of higher or lower prevalence and if you had a single species barcode analysis, that would certainly be the way to address that. Not only is the species there, but is the species or the DNA of that species presence in much higher area than another. All right, we've got a pretty good number of questions here. Um, one question is, what's the cost per lake for eDNA analysis and how does that compare with traditional sampling costs? Yeah, sure. Good question. I can tell you that the non-personnel cost uh, of eDNA from, uh, you know, the, the stuff, you know, that you go out to collect the DNA, to extract the DNA, um, to do all the manipulations, PCR and the sequencing is probably uh, $30 a sample, plus or minus. Okay, so if you were doing um, 50 samples of a lake, um, each sample at $30, you'd be $1,500 for a lake, uh, and then you'd tack on the, the personnel charge. So, um, you know, with uh, these, these status and trends projects, um, you know, I've, I've been out on them, uh, I think, once. Uh, but, I mean, they're multi-day projects, so you have travel time. Um, the crews are... You know, you know, so the personnel costs are really pretty high, right? So you have multiple days, you have travel time, you have hotel time, you know, there's time to process the samples. Um, so I guess I, I don't have enough familiarity about, uh, you know, the cost categories uh, for uh, the Status and Trends program to be able to look at a relative uh, thing. But uh, for, for all the consumable supplies to get the sequence information, without the human cost, without the number of hours and, and the people doing the work uh, for just, for 50 samples, it's about $30 per sample. Okay, is there any concern with false positive detections, particularly for AIS, um, that, you know, species that may not have been detected with traditional means? Uh, absolutely there is. And, and so you saw the picture of people with gloves, um, so every sample is handled with a different pair of gloves. Um, every sample, um, the filter is handled with a sterile forceps. Um, every lake, we take multiple, what we call negative DNA control samples. So we'll take um, uh, distilled water out there and we'll suck the distilled water through the filters. And so we have evidence or we test for, um, you know, DNA and samples which should not have DNA uh, in the field. Um, in the lab when the DNA is being extracted, in the lab when the PCR reactions are taking place, 
And you do get some um, uh, non-zeros. And the way that we handle the non-zeros um, is we use um, a mean of all the non-zero detections as a threshold for a cutoff, where if we have samples of a particular species that are behold below that threshold, we consider that even if, if the sequence of that species is there, it's not, uh, it's not considered there. So, um, you know, it depends on the species, even some where, where you have, well, we, we use that even for really invasive uh, species. But um, I think if there were some species where we use that cutoff criteria uh, based on no DNA controls, uh, we would probably still um, alert the, uh, the regulatory uh, or management agencies of what we had found. And we've, we've done that in a couple of instances. Following up on that, it's, um, there's a question that the uh, aquatic invasive species that you sampled using eDNA included the four Asian carps. Were those samples from inland lakes? Yes. I believe there was a DNR press release on some of that information uh, a month or so ago because it was followed up by um, uh, analysis of the same samples at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Reserve Lab in La Crosse. Okay. Um, will Michigan DNR be able to use this techn technology soon for lake monitoring? Um, I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, in my mind, yes. Um, I think that, you know, if you can go out, I mean, if you, if you think about you wanted to sample plants, you want to sample crayfish, you want to sample mussels, you want to sample, you know, everything, then you would have to deploy different gear, you know, um, if, if even there's gear available to do that quantitatively with some things. Um, and so, I mean, if, even if it's just with fish, I think that in, in our mind, the sensitivity of the technique um, uh, is, is positive. I mean, it doesn't tell you some things that traditional gear will tell you. So for instance, if you're interested in recruitment, you're interested in size structure of the population, I think what, what the eDNA will do is will give you a relative biomass estimate relative to other species, but it's not gonna tell you the size distribution of the species or the year class strength of you know, the previous years because you don't have a fish in hand, you can't take a hard structure, you can't age it, you can't take a length or a weight. Um, but in terms of um, enumerating communities, um, detecting species presence absence, um, um, relative biomass, um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's shown, in particular in situations where the species are in low abundance, I think uh, in our hands, based on 22 very heterogeneous lakes, um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, there's tremendous potential. So you say potential, would it be fair to characterize it as a, a potential um, technique that uh, isn't currently in the STASM Trends plan, sampling plan um, or, or future plans, is that correct? I, I, I really have not been part of discussions. Um, that's beyond my pay grade. Um, I mean, we're developing the technology um, and we're trying to apply the technology and develop um, standing, standard operating procedures where that technology could be executed um, to the best way possible. And I guess that's, uh, that's where, you know, working with the, uh, the agencies, particularly EGLE and the DNR that we've, uh, we've had our role, um, um, how this would be operationalized and where, whether it would be and under what circumstances is entirely up to the agencies. Okay, thanks. But we would certainly be willing to continue to work with them to see that if there was a need, um, you know, how to apply it. Sure. Can eDNA samples um, or the water samples or the filters themselves be archived for analysis at a later date, for example, frozen? And if so, how long um, of a window do you have while those samples are valid? You know, you, we, I showed a picture of um, um, the uh, water sample being, uh, or the filter, where is it? 
uh, right here. So that filter is taken and put in 95% ethanol. It's good to go for decades. All right. Um, can eDNA be used to detect hybrid Eurasian water milfoil? Um, using the RBCL primer, um, we're able to identify milfoil uh, to, um, well, actually, no. Um, because uh, the marker that we're using is not a biparentally inherited marker. It's inherited in plants paternally on the chloroplast, and thus you only get the, the paternal contribution. Uh, so no, you are not able to tell high, well, at least with, with our marker, right? I mean, um, if you were to develop um, a, a nuclear marker, so if you had other markers, other genes out there where there were species differences, you could certainly develop a PCR primer, um, and based on that, you would be able to um, uh, tell whether you had, I wouldn't use metabarcoding, I would use, uh, you know, develop a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, uh, PCR uh, assay to really quickly assay for it. Um, uh, but you could certainly interrogate a filter that you sampled um, and use that DNA for that PCR reaction, but you can't use these, uh, 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 you know, uniparentally inherited markers to look at hybrids. Okay. Um, when detecting eDNA, how do you know the different abundance is due to higher presence of defined species or to larger individuals resident in the area? How do you know you're detecting DNA from live fish? Uh, you don't. I mean, it could be uh, feces uh, from uh, a fish that ate it. Um, no, you don't. That's why I said that the relative sequence abundance relative to other species. Okay, so maybe you have a thousand species for species X, 10 for species Y, right? So one species is 10 higher relative sequence abundance. You can have many small fish or you could have one big fish. So you don't have an piece of information with the relative sequence abundance to look at the relative abundance of that species for that very reason. It could be many small or big. What you have is in what we found and what's been published in the literature repeatedly is that it's a decent surrogate estimate of relative biomass of that species in that water sample. Biomass, not abundance. Okay. Um, what's the best way for lake or fisheries managers to get lakes tested for fish species with eDNA? For example, should they look for local researchers doing similar studies, ask around at local labs, or is there still a very limited list of groups that can analyze these data? Um, I think there's a, I mean, is it how large or how small? I mean, there are a lot of academic labs that have these capabilities. Um, you know, across the Midwest, there are multiple labs in the state of Michigan. Um, I'm really not that familiar with uh, private labs um, that are doing, uh, you know, this work for, um, you know, for profit. Um, but I would imagine that uh, they also exist. Um, I, I think there are a lot of uh, pay for, you know, fee for uh, service uh, places that have the capabilities of doing this work, um, um, they may not have the field capabilities. And I guess that's one of the critical things because, um, again, you ha it, it, it's so sensitive of a technique and there's such a potential for contamination that, you know, you just can't send uh, a lake association group out to a lake um, and, you know, have them practice um, antiseptic collection techniques to the point um, that they, you know, can submit something, um, you know, without a lot of training, I, I, you know, certainly some, some amount of training, right? Um, and so um, it would have to be, you know, if this was operationalized, the, probably the best way to do it, you know, if it was done on an agency basis, would be to either cooperate with, say, a lab, at a university like our lab, or to have a crew um, that would be an eDNA crew, right? These would be highly trained people, not necessarily in the laboratory aspect of it, 
but highly trained people that were aware of and is extremely conscious about the need for antiseptic uh, care and treatment uh, and sampling. Um, and um, I guess that's, um, uh, that in my mind would be uh, a, a way to uh, really get a, a, a decent um, uh, sample uh, into the lab for interrogation. Okay, we have two questions around um, the movement of eDNA within a lake. So what is known, and you've touched on this briefly already in one of your first answers, but um, what is known about the movement or aggregation of eDNA within a lake versus the actual distribution of fish? And rel uh, related to that, you know, is eDNA attached to particles that settle? Um, and the spatial patterns in lakes suggest some removal rate by degradation or settling. <laughs> That's a lot of moving parts. Uh, I, if I don't get the whole thing, uh, please read it back again. Um, so eDNA um, is not neutral. Um, the DNA is in uh, oftentimes uh, in you know cellular material uh, associated with feces um, and other things, and it does have a tendency to um, to sink. Um, um, it also uh, is buoyant enough where it stays in the water column long enough where it's subjected to you know wave action, um, and um, and so it moves around. Um, it's also um, negatively charged, the DNA is, and thus uh, it has propensities of binding to um, cations, so clays, silica, like sand, uh, these types of products uh, tend to bind to it um, and uh, will precipitate um, out. So um, it's more buoyant and warmer than colder temperatures. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things um, that affect, uh, you know, wh where, uh, where it is and where it goes and how long it stays there. I'm looking for a slide. So again, this is a slide. So each one of these is um, a location, okay? And this is the relative abundance of that species at each of these gear types in these different locations, okay? And so um, th these, these don't match these locations, but I, I think that, um, so the fact that we only see um, channel catfish with this experimental gill net in one location, don't see it anywhere else in the lake, but channel catfish DNA is all over the lake. Well, does that mean that catfish are all over the lake or does it mean that catfish DNA is being dispersed by catfish from this one location. I would say that it's maybe uh, a little bit of both that, but um, so this reflects movements of uh, eDNA, but I would also say that catfish are probably in more locations than just that experimental gill net set. Um, uh, it, they, just, they just weren't detected. But I mean, I guess it, it, it depends if this is a, where are they question? Um, I think that, you know, again, I think that maps like this are, are pretty compelling to me. Um, you know, this is top to bottom, north to south, left to right, uh, um, east and west. And so, I mean, is this high prevalence and high prevalence here just due to the prevailing wind action? Um, well, maybe not, because why don't you see carp eDNA also being blown into these uh, eastward areas of the lake? You see high areas of carp where there are low areas of species abundance and vice versa. And so I think if you're looking at things even within a lake like this, um, you know, are the species um, there or is it, you know, ghosts of fish swimming past, um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, the really good literature that people are working on this are oceans. And so they're using oceanographic models. They're using particles um, which are dye colored, which are uh, have the same relative buoyancy as DNA. 
And they're doing some really marvelous work with these types of dye, and they're doing it in freshwater systems as well. And so there are oceanographic models and freshwater models that would predict, given a deposition of a certain area, what the distribution of those molecules uh, might be. And I think things like you know, wind direction, um, you know, the length of time the wind is blowing in that direction, um, et cetera, uh, you know, are, um, are important. So not an easy question, but those are some, some ideas anyway. Um, question here, is there any work being done to tease apart the variation of fish species or life stage DNA shedding? For example, does a highly mobile species artificially elevate the amount of eDNA detected? Well, I guess it depends on what the fish are doing when they're moving. Um, you know, like fish moving up river to spawn, the, the fact that they're extruding gametes means they're extruding DNA. And a lot of people are using eDNA very profitably of trying to locate the spawning locations of adfluvial species, right? So there's a situation where a species is moving and it's doing something biologically relevant uh, to extruding DNA. So in that particular case, yeah, I mean, a lot of times the fish are moving, they're eating, um, they're constantly defecating. And so, I mean, you're detecting DNA certainly where the fish are because, uh, you know, I think uh, probably, you know, they're extruding DNA from the gills, they're extruding DNA from the skin, sloughed off, you know, uh, mucosa, um, but probably a large source of DNA, both of the, of the fish eating other fish as well as the other fish being eaten are associated with, you know, with, uh, with feces. Yeah, we've still got a fair number of questions, so I'm going to touch on a couple more and then we'll probably um, have to wrap up. Um, is there a metabar coding database currently available for detecting fish parasites or for other invertebrates such as bryozoans or oligochaetes? Um, you know, it's not an area that I actively work in. I will say that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recently funded through the GLRI initiative several um, database development projects, which included lower vertebra lower um, lower eukaryotes, um, including some of these groups. And so, I would say um, that there could be databases online. I mean, what we've had to do, and I think this would be a profitable area to explore, was just going through the uh, the National Center for Biological Information, the NCBI uh, database, just take your species uh, or multiple species of interest and just blast and see if you have, uh, wh where you have the sequences and whether or not there is a specific uh, marker, a specific gene region, which are in common for many of the species. And, um, you know, that would be the, how we started to develop our databases. We've searched databases and to the extent that we filled holes, we've relied on cooperators and Eagle and the DNR to provide samples, whether they be plants or, you know, mollusks or crayfish or fish, and we've done the sequencing ourselves once those regions have been identified. Okay, um, how trustable is the quality of the DNA retrieved for genotyping purposes? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll try to interpret that. I, we're reading between the lines. I'm assuming that you're wanting that, so a sample in a population genetic sense, right? So are there, you know, fish, uh, uh, you know, multiple fish of the same species there, that type of a thing? Um, there are people that are doing that. Um, uh, you know, I th the, the problem is, is, you know, looking at abundance of type X versus type Y, right? So you could have some sequence variability. Again, we're working with, for fish, mitochondrial DNA markers. They're unisexually inherited markers. And so you don't have genotypes per se. You have haplotypes, right? So it's one, it's, it's either one thing or another, and it's within a couple of base pairs. I mean, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to get many sequences from the same species so we can look at intraspecific variation. So we know what level of sequence divergence between different sequence types are within the same species versus in a different species, right? And so we have some empirically um, uh, uh, estimated areas of demarcation of 
sequence divergence. But I think there, there, I know there are several people that are working on it. Um, uh, there are a couple of publications I could, you know, if, if you wanted to send me an email, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, uh, send you some some references um, on that, but I would say that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty early on uh, in the development, uh, in the development of that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll do one last question. Um, so can eDNA relative abundance and biomass estimates be compared between lakes? Or do lake characteristics highly influence the eDNA output such that the relative biomass estimates can only be relative to other species within that lake? Yeah, absolutely. It's only relative to that lake, right? So it's a it's a relative sequence abundance, but it's only relative to the other things in that lake. Okay. But, I mean, you, you could ask the same. I mean, you could say, well, is the relative uh, sequence abundance high in Lake X, and it's also high in Lake Lake Y, um, and you might have different fish communities, but it's still biologically relevant. I think, even the you know. But yeah. the denominator is the total number of sequences. And, you know, on average, we have maybe 20,000 fish sequences, uh, you know, that we're looking at. And, you know, so that's, that's the total, that's the denominator, but you're dividing that up with different, you know, species richnesses. I mean, we had, you know, 12 to 42 were, were the differences in species relative abundances um, in the lakes that we were surveying. So, um, uh, so I think if it's, you know, if it's high, high, high or high, low, I think that's telling. Um, I'd have to give a little thought about how to make that comparison across lakes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Scribner. Um, I know this was a very well attended webinar and uh, I know there was a lot of interest. And so I, I will speak on the half, the half of the attendees and say thank you. Um, you can oh, imagine right. there would be a round of applause if they were able to do so. Yeah, well, you, everybody be safe and uh, hopefully we'll see each other uh, in a different venue shortly. That's quite right. Now, if, if people want to follow up with you and ask more questions, is there a way that they can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah. Um, That'd probably be the best way. Okay, so emailing at scrib, S C R I B N E 3 at msu.edu. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, this has been a Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership webinar, and um, I encourage everyone to check in with the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership webinars in the future. We'll be doing one uh, each Thursday for the next three Thursdays. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Have a good day and be safe.